Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Larry Skogan. It's my good fortune to be the president of Bismarck State, and I just want to welcome all of you to our uh, space up here, the Bavendick State Room of the National Energy Center of Excellence. Um, for those of you that have been to conversations before, we always had them over in Sydney J. Lee. This is going to be very different. Uh, the staff tells me that there's more technology over here to handle what we're doing. We do live streams and and we're going to be uh, we're going to have uh, chatting going back and forth here after the at the next conversation. And so there's all sorts of technology that they have uh, available to them over here. So, but I certainly thank all of you for coming out today. It's a beautiful day. Um, I know most of you did this already, but right now I know your rapt attention is going to be in this direction. But uh, after we're done with the program here, you might want to walk over to the window and take a look out and see that beautiful view. Um, I'm, I'm told that the hardest thing about keeping this place clean up here is keeping the nose prints off the glass over here. So, and, uh, and we certainly welcome all of you. To, this is your building. This is the uh, state of North Dakota building, and uh, we want everybody to really enjoy it and use it. Um, I'm not going to go through a lot of, uh, of administrative details today because we've got so much to talk about and we have a very special guest and I certainly would not keep the President of the United States waiting on administrative announcements. So without any further ado, please welcome to our stage the third President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson, it is certainly a distinctive honor to have you here today. Um, you are in uh, North Dakota, Bismarck State College, and probably the northern reaches of the Louisiana Purchase. How far west did you ever get when you traveled? Well, first of all, let me say hello to everyone and to congratulate you on bringing civilization here to the upper Missouri. Uh, uh, I purchased the Louisiana Territory from Napoleon in 1803, and at the time we really didn't know altogether what we had purchased. Uh, I sent ministers to France to buy the village of New Orleans in order to keep the Mississippi River open. The Mississippi River was already the main commercial artery of this country, and France and Spain had been trading the Louisiana Territory back and forth for a number of decades. And whichever country controlled the mouth of the, the Mississippi River could control the economic destiny of the United States. So I sent my protege, James Monroe, over to France in the spring of 1803 to help solve this problem, to keep the Mississippi River open to us in perpetuity. And Napoleon Bonaparte was the dictator of France at the time, and he was about to go to war with Great Britain in, in what amounted to a world war. And he was aware that during that war he would almost certainly lose New Orleans and lose control of the Mississippi to the British. The British had the greatest navy in the world. And so instead of selling me the village of New Orleans for about six million dollars, which is what we had intended, he made a counteroffer and, and asked Monroe and Livingston if they might wish to purchase the entire Louisiana Territory for $15.6 million. This had not been my intention, but I was able to purchase what I called an empire for liberty, such as the world has never previously seen, for three cents per acre. But nobody knew the boundaries. The boundaries in the southwest in what's now Texas were murky, and the Spanish were very upset by this, um, this transaction. And the boundaries here were murky because, as, you, as I'm sure you all know, what I purchased was the Missouri River watershed, but your North Dakota shares two watersheds. One is the Hudson's Bay, Red River, Cheyenne, Souris River watershed. Those waters flow into the Arctic, and they were not part of the purchase. And so when the treaty was being ratified by the United States Senate in the fall of 1803, if the Senate had ratified it as the treaty had been written, your North Dakota would be only the Missouri Valley. But 
John Quincy Adams, the, the son of my friend John Adams, objected and said we, we needed to keep as much access to the fur trade for the United States as possible, and so he changed the provision in the treaty to allow a commission eventually to settle the northern boundary. That was settled in 1818, and that's why North Dakota is squared off at the 49th parallel. I, I never traveled farther than 75 miles west of my birthplace, but I followed the journey of uh, my friend Meriwether Lewis with great curiosity. And, and before I turn it back to you, I just want to say that as we sit here looking at the river, I never saw the Missouri River. I would have loved to have seen it. But to think that a, about October 20th, 1804, Mr. Lewis with his three boats, a 55-foot keel boat, and two pirogues, a red pirogue and a white pirogue, and about 50 individuals was laboring past this very point at about half a mile per hour. And so if I had been here then, I could have greeted Mr. Lewis <laughs> as he explored the Missouri River. I had no idea what an extraordinary river it is. Mm -hmm. You're fortunate to have yeah, it. It is. Um, Mr. Jefferson, I'm interested, you keep talking about Mr. Lewis, but in our time we always talk about Lewis and Clark. Um, what, what were your thoughts about the two of them? I hired Lewis, he was my correspondence secretary in the White House. He was a neighbor of mine, his mother Lucy Marks was a friend of mine, and they supplied turkeys and hams for the tables at Monticello. Mr. Lewis's father died when he was five years old and during the revolution, so Lewis effectively was raised by his mother, and he became a protege of mine. I collected protégés in Virginia, and when I became the President of the United States on March 4th, 1801, after one of the most contested elections in American history, I hired young Meriwether Lewis to be my private secretary in what you call the White House. And he lived with me for two and a half years as my aide-de-camp and private secretary before I sent him on this mission. So I hired Lewis to do it and trained him in the latitude and longitude and sent him off to Philadelphia to learn some medical skills and some Linnaean binomial classification and so on. And then he determined that the expedition would be too complicated and too difficult for a single commander. And he therefore chose William Clark to be his co-captain with my permission, but I always for the rest of my life called it the Lewis Expedition because it was Lewis that Congress sent on the mission. Okay, well thank you. Um, we do have a topic we're going to talk about here today that I'll be introducing to you soon here, Mr. President, but, um, and, and even saying that, if, if I could ask you, um, did they call you Mr. President or Mr. Jefferson? I know General Washington was called His Excellency, but I've never heard you referred to in that term. I, you can call me Mr. Jefferson. You, you can call me uh, the president if you want. Uh, I, I actually proposed that we do away with these titles. You know, the French Revolution occurred in 1789. I was in France when the French Revolution began. I was serving as the American ambassador to France, effectively. And one of the things I liked about the French Revolution is that they eliminated titles, Mr., Miss, Doctor, Esquire, and replaced it with a universal title, Citizen. Citizen is what we all share. Citizen Scogan, Citizen Smith, Citizen Hamilton. That levels these artificial hierarchies that have bedeviled European history and created false social distinctions between different individuals. I wanted to do away with those titles in the United States if we could. Well, meanwhile, when I got back to this country in 1789, I had been appointed the first Secretary of State by George Washington and John Adams was the vice president, and because Adams was the vice president, he was the presiding officer over the Senate. That's the one function that a vice president has. And Adams, who's a good friend of mine, believed firmly that our government would never have credibility unless we adopted titles for our national officers. And so he spent two weeks of congressional time insisting that we create titles for the president and the vice president and the Supreme Court justices. And he wanted, if you can believe this, he wanted George Washington to be called His Excellency and the Preserver of American Liberty. That would be his title. <laughs> and other, all other officers would have similarly pompous titles. 
But finally, my closest friend, James Madison, the, the father of the Constitution, pointed out that the Constitution was quite explicit that this being was to be called the president. And that settled it, except that John Adams was so determined for titles that the wits of Congress gave him one, and it stuck with him for the rest of his life. For the rest of his life, he was known as his rotundity. <laughs> so you can call me Mr. Jefferson, or, Mr. Jefferson. No, and, and not to be too stiff about it, but no one called me Thomas, not even my wife. I mean, my, my wife and children would have said Mr. Jefferson. It was, it was like we lived in a, essentially in a Jane Austen novel where everybody was formal all of the time. And my closest friend, James Madison, would never under any circumstance have called me Tom or Thomas. He would have said, Mr. Jefferson, would you have a little more Madeira? Would you, would you, would you like to go with me on a botanizing expedition to New England, but there was very much more formality in my age than there is in yours. So I will call you Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> I will call you Mr. Jefferson. Very well. Okay. Uh, so Mr. Jefferson, one more question, and then we're going to get into the topic of the hour. Here. Right. And that is that we just, as a nation, went through an inauguration. And, uh, and I know you did that twice, and our current president has now done it twice. Um, do you have any thoughts about comparison to your inauguration, to what, what has transpired here just recently? Well, it, it wouldn't be for me to try to comment on your world. My favorite principle of all of the principles of my life is that the earth belongs to the living, not the dead. I wrote this in a letter to James Madison from France, and I was thinking about the French Revolution and what it represented. And when there's a revolution, as in France, or our own in 1776, it raises fundamental questions about how we govern ourselves, how we distribute wealth, how we settle disputes, how we engage in foreign policy. I mean, these, these radical, fundamental questions have to be answered. And that's one of the great things about revolution, is it turns you back on these first principles. And so, I believe strongly that each generation must dream its own dreams, govern itself according to its best insights, and that it would be a terrible mistake for your generation or any generation to look back naively at the Founding Fathers and assume that we were extraordinarily wise men. We were men like other men. We had good thoughts and foolish thoughts. We had good days and bad days. There were heroes and villains amongst us. The Founding Fathers were not a phalanx. They were not a monolith. They, we, we didn't agree on most questions. We had the same frailties and foibles that all human beings have. We did our best to, to lay the, the groundwork for an American democratic republic, but I think it would be a mistake to assume that the Founding Fathers, with a capital F, are some special cluster of, of sages, each generation needs to look around and say, what do the demographics tell us? What do our technologies permit? And what are the, the dangers of those technologies? What do we still care about in American life? What can we learn from prior generations without being slavishly attached to their systems? And so I believe very strongly that the earth belongs to the living that is to you and not to me. My generation has been gone now for you know, 250 years and I lived in a three mile per hour world. You know, if the French had wanted to invade the United States in 1798, which some people believe they did, it would have taken them two or three months to send troops across the Atlantic Ocean and by the time they got here, they would be so ill of scurvy and malnutrition and fatigue that we could have picked them off with sticks and stones at the shore. Nothing traveled faster than three miles per hour. And so for you to sort of pluck the founding fathers out of our time and our place and our set of circumstances and naively to apply them to your world would be the greatest mistake that you could possibly make. So let me just quickly tell you what my inaugural was. 
I was the third president of the United States. It was a very hotly contested election. I won by the narrowest of margins. In fact, it was eventually the House of Representatives that determined it. I was staying in a boarding house in Washington City. Washington, D.C. was our new national capital. It was, it was really just a howling wilderness. Pennsylvania Avenue was, was muddy. There were stumps of trees. Pigs were rooting about it. The White House was unfinished. The Capitol was unfinished. There were a handful of boarding houses and some very poor restaurants. There wasn't a single bookshop. There wasn't a wine shop or a tobacco shop. I mean, it was really a howling wilderness. I was staying in a boarding house called Conrad's, and I strolled, not wearing a military uniform, not escorted by a military escort. I simply strolled with a few friends from the boarding house over to the unfinished Senate chamber of the Capitol, and there took the oath of office as the third president, and then there were between 800 and 1,000 people there, which is a lot. The capital, the population of Washington, D.C. was 3,000, and that was mostly Georgetown and Alexandria. Then I took out of my pocket my first inaugural address, which I had written with extreme care, and I read it, but I am so shy. I'm a very, very, very shy man and a poor public speaker. And I read it, but I mumbled. And literally, none of you would have been able to hear it. I mean, only 10 or 15 people in that Senate chamber heard what I had to say. And the rest afterwards went out, and there were printed copies. And people then took them home and read them at their leisure. But I think that would suggest some contrast with the inaugurals of your time. There was no parade. There was no ball. In fact, afterwards, after I had taken the oath of office and given my little speech, I walked back to Conrad's. It was dinner time. And I sat at the same chair I had sat in for the previous two months, not the head or the foot of the table, just person 12. And a woman who was there said, well, now I suppose we all have to yield to you, Mr. Jefferson. And I said, no, we're having dinner here. And so I'm, I'm an egalitarian. Very Republican. Small r, Republican. You know, there are, the, your parties, you have your Democratic Party and your Republican Party, they bear no resemblance to the parties of our time. When I use the word Republican or Republic, I mean a constitutional system in which the people are sovereign and they send representatives from amongst themselves to do their public business. Um, just so you know, Mr. Jefferson, estimates are that the current president his speech was heard in real time by a billion people. The population of the earth was less than a billion people in my time. Uh, it, it, I can't even imagine this. But if I could imagine it, I would faint. I mean, I would not want to be heard by a billion people. I don't know a billion people. You know, I. I said in a private letter that I could not in public raise my voice above the level of a whisper. And if you had said to me in my time, Mr. Jefferson, or if you'd said to Adams or Hamilton or any number of people, we want you to travel to such and such a place and give a talk to people you have never met, without a single exception, all of the founding fathers would have said no. Because we would not have presumed that we can simply appear and that people would want to hear a complete stranger. Okay, let's get to the topic of, of the hour, Mr. Jefferson. We asked you to come here and to talk about religion, and specifically to talk about the uh, church and state. And as, as you very well know, Mr. Jefferson, nowhere in our Constitution is there a term of a wall of separation between church and state. However, it's, it's almost an American principle, but I believe you were the author of that, that uh, principle. And can you tell us where that principle came from? One is, where did you actually pen it? And two, what were you thinking about when you did that? First of all, I was not at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. I wrote the Declaration of Independence in 1776, but in 1787 I was the American minister to the court of Louis XVI in France. And so when the 55 men 
met in Philadelphia between May and September of 1787, the Constitutional Convention. I was not among them. My closest friend was there, James Madison, and many others of my friends, Dr. Franklin and George Washington and so on. But I was not there, and they had a secrecy rule that nobody could talk about anything that was going on within their chambers until the Constitution was completed. And so I didn't have the slightest clue what they were doing until the convention was over on September 18th, 1787, and then three of my friends sent me copies, hand copied, George Washington, who had been the president of the convention, James Madison, the father of the Constitution, and Benjamin Franklin, who was the senior um, American at, the, at, at this, this extraordinary gathering of talent. So I had nothing to do with the Constitution. However, I should tell you that the Constitution makes no reference to God ever. The Constitution is an entirely secular document. You can read it with, for the rest of time and you will find no reference to God, the Creator, or any other entity representing a deity. That's, I think, a really important fact of the Constitution. The First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law respecting freedom of religion. I came back in 1789. I was appointed to be the first Secretary of State. Then later I became the Vice President in the Adams Administration. And in 181, I became the third President of the United States. I had always had a reputation for being, embracing a range of religious sensibilities and wanting there to be a free marketplace of religions in America and not an established church. In fact, the first thing that I did in Virginia after the Declaration of Independence was write something called the Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty. It's one of the three things for which I wish to be remembered on my tombstone. The Declaration of Independence of 1776, the University of Virginia, which I created in my retirement, and then in the middle, the Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty. And that bill, which was passed into law in Virginia, nowhere else, in 1786, disestablished the Church of England. Up till then, the Church of England was the official church of the Commonwealth of Virginia. That was the nature of the world at this time. To this day, Great Britain has an official church, the, the Church of England, in your time. And so I wrote this bill to disestablish the Church of England in Virginia, and in it said that anyone can worship the God of their choice without civil penalty and without civil reward. That's the, the nature of a free society. Well. When I was president, I got a letter from Baptists from Danbury, Connecticut. Now, you have to remember that at that time, Baptists were regarded as a dangerous fringe Protestant sect, and they had been persecuted all over the world. They were upstart, evangelical, radical Protestants, and they were seen as socially dangerous, doctrinally dangerous, and not of respectability. They wrote me a letter of appreciation when I was serving at my first term as president to say thank you for championing a free marketplace of religious ideas and would you, Mr. Jefferson, clarify your understanding of what the Constitution intends. So that's the background to this. And on the first day of January, 183, I replied to the Baptists of Danbury, and I used the occasion to try to, to, to state the principle in natural law. And what I said was, my reading of the First Amendment, and now I'm quoting, is that it erects a wall of separation between church and state. And so that phrase, wall of separation between church and state, is not in the Constitution. It's not in the Bill of Rights. When I wrote it, I was writing as the President of the United States, but I wasn't writing it as Holy Writ. I was simply creating a phrase which I thought nicely encapsulated the principles of freedom of religion, and particularly the principles as outlined in the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Had I known that the phrase would take on the significance that it has, I probably wouldn't have written it because I don't think that a president has the right to cloud the constitutional 
tradition in that way. I had no idea that in the 20th century, in, in your most recent century, courts over and over again would point to that phrase rather than the Constitution itself in enforcing the wall of separation. That puts an enormous burden on me. You know, John Adams said of me, and I excuse me for making, this will sound egotistical and I don't mean to, but John Adams said that Mr. Jefferson has, quote, a peculiar felicity for expression. And so there I go, writing to the Baptists. I used the best phrase I could think of. I had no idea it would become this important. And if I had, I would have shrunk from that burden because I don't think that I can adequately represent the intentions of the founders on questions of this sort. When did that term, what, was it in your own time that that term became almost a principle of American government? No, it, it wasn't really until your 20th century. It, it was bandied about from time to time, but first of all, it was not a significant issue until the 20th century because you have to understand that the national government was a very weak and tiny thing in my time. And the real business was in the states, Virginia, Maryland, New Hampshire, et cetera. And so the national government was sort of beside the point for most Americans. Most Americans in my time had no intercourse with their national government whatsoever. Our systems of communication were exceedingly weak, so that letter would not have been broadcast in some sense to the world. It was, it was just a, a letter that the Baptists handed around, but it didn't find its way into newspapers and so on. That's one thing. Secondly, the Supreme Court did not have the power in that era that it has subsequently gained. So the first time that the Supreme Court ever struck down a provision in, a, in an act of Congress was in the famous case Marbury v. Madison in 1803, involved me, when Chief Justice John Marshall said that the Supreme Court could decide what laws were constitutional and what were not. That was the first instance of what's known as judicial review. The second instance of judicial review didn't come until the Dred Scott decision 50 years later. And so you, in your time, judicial review is essential. Every year the Supreme Court sits in judgment of 20 or 30 or 40 cases, says this is constitutional, this is not. No such power existed in my time. And so it wasn't until the 20th century when the courts became as important as they have subsequently become that they then found that phrase and began to use it as a paraphrase of the intentions of the First Amendment. So it, it, it played no significant controversial role in my time. Okay. And it, what exactly did you mean when you wrote that? What, what were you talking about this wall and, and how do you tie that to the First Amendment? I want to try to explain it in a way that doesn't sound too um, filled with, with, with legal jargon. I'll ask you this question. It's a simple question. What am I thinking at this moment? Sorry, Mr. Jefferson, I don't know. Okay. So tell me to, tell me to think that one plus one is four. Okay. Think that one plus one is four. Am I thinking that? I don't know. <laughs> Dr. Skogan, Mr. President, look out on the people who are in this audience and ask yourself, just look at four or five faces, make eye contact, and ask yourself what that person is thinking. At this moment, I've got a pretty good idea. What is it? <laughs> what, what is that? They're, they're trying to find out where Mr. Jefferson's taking no, this conversation. No, but take this seriously. Look, look at these two women right here and ask, ask yourself what they're thinking. Do you know? I do. No, you don't. Yeah, they want to know what we're doing. <laughs> no, you're, you're not playing the Socratic game very well. <laughs> you have no idea what they're thinking. They could be thinking that they wish they were somewhere else. <laughs> they could be thinking that, that Mr. Jefferson is the greatest fool who ever lived. They could be thinking that if only Jefferson's principles had been followed, we'd be a, you know, you have no idea what anyone's thinking. I don't know what you're thinking. You don't know what I'm thinking. Why? Because the mind is utterly free and uncoercible. Is that correct? Correct. So you can tell me that one plus one is four, but you can never make me believe it, can you? Correct. 
Now, you could put a gun to my head and make me say it. That's tyranny. I can put a gun to your head and make you believe in the Trinity or the virgin birth or the miracles or atonement, the apocalypse. I can, I can force you to say what I want you to say if I use enough power. But there's no circumstance under which I can ever make you believe anything that your brain doesn't tell you is true. Is that correct? Correct. So government mustn't attempt to put pressure on your freedom of thinking because they can't do it even if they want to. They can make you a hypocrite, but they cannot make you believe that which does not ring true to your own conscience. So we have two types of rights under natural law. We have alienable rights, and we have inalienable rights. You probably wondered about this. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Unalienable rights, I say in the Declaration of Independence. Two types, alienable, unalienable. The difference is this. If you were living in a state of nature, just out in the woods here in the time of Lewis and Clark, there'd be no government at all. But if you and I became neighbors, we would form a social compact. Your property line ends here, my property begins there. If your hogs get on my corn, I come and ask for a redress. We create a code, a system, a social compact, a system of sorting out our collective business. We call that a constitution or a social compact. Those are alienable rights. Instead of, if, you, if your hogs get on my property, instead of shooting them or getting into a duel with you, we entrust an arbitrator to determine it and to assess damages. That's the legal system. Instead of my educating my children and you're educating your children, which we have a right to do, we pool our money and hire a teacher and create a curriculum. Instead of my sending a courier with all of my letters to South Carolina and you doing the same, we create a post office. So we alienate certain of our natural rights into the social compact, into a, a government to do certain things for us. Those are alienable rights. I'm alienating money from my pocket to pay that teacher, and I'm alienating my right to self-defense to a police and a court system. Then there are unalienable or inalienable rights, and those are ones that we can't give to government even if we wish to, and government can't take from us even if it wants to. And the most fundamental of all the unalienable rights is freedom of conscience. So government must do only those things that government can do, and things that government cannot do, we must never allow government to try to do. And the most sacred of all rights is the right to freedom of thinking, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of petition. And the minute you allow government to get into that zone, it's taking powers that it doesn't deserve under natural law, and it can only do it badly. And so if you look at the history of religion, state churches have tyrannized people. When I grew up in Virginia, for example, I had to be baptized in the Anglican church by law. I had to be confirmed. I had to take sacraments. I had to attend church services. And if I were absent, I could be fined. And if I were repeatedly absent, I could be imprisoned. I had to pay taxes to the Anglican clergy even if I were a Baptist or a Jew or a Mohammedan. That's tyranny. And so I disestablished the Church of England in Virginia and allowed a level playing field so that every religion could find the people that adhered to it. That's the principle. And the minute the government decides what you think or what chapel you shall attend, it's being despotic and tyrannical. And so it needs to stay out of that zone. And when it does, everybody's happy. And every society in which there has been a, an official religion has had two things happen. First of all, it has corrupted both religion and government. And it creates deep cynicism in the people because they're paying tithes to a church that they don't support. And so I see this as the most fundamental of American principles. Do you see this wall as absolute? Is there any 
any condition under which the government can be involved in religion? You yourself, when you were president, you would allow church services in the Capitol? At, at what point th does that wall kick in then? This is a hard question. When I was president, we allowed ecumenical church services to take place in the capital of the United States, ecumenical, on a rotating basis, and only because there was no other space available in the District of Columbia. In other words, they came to me and said, there's no place to hold these services, Mr. Jefferson, would you mind if we held them in the capital? And I said, as long as they're ecumenical, as long as there's no settled doctrine, as long as there's no imposition of one sect or one church over another, fine. So I'm, I'm flexible because I don't think we need to be doctrinaire about these things. But if you say to me, this is, what was, this is known as casuistry, if you put certain cases to me, if you say, shall we pray in a school? Then I will say no. Because if you pray in a school, you are imposing a religious sensibility on 30 or 60 or 100 people, and you don't know whether they're all Christians. If they're Christians, you don't know whether they're Methodists or Lutherans or Baptists or Catholics. Some of them could be Jews. Some of them could worship the Manitou of the Iroquois. Some of them could be Hindus. Some of them could be Islamic, and the state cannot impose its religious sensibility on the people. Even if the people want it, the state can't. And if you do, even if you had an ecumenical prayer before a classroom, you would effectively be creating an establishment of a Christian religion in the United States. Now, in my time, most of us were Christians. And the mistake that the American people sometimes make, or some leaders make, is to confuse the demographics with constitutional intention. In other words, we have been essentially a Christian nation, but we are not officially Christian or Jewish or Mohammedan or anything else. We're officially neutral. And to confuse those two things has brought about a lot of chaos in the course of American history. But in my opinion, when the government is challenged, the government must always back off into neutrality. Okay, I have a sense, Mr. Jefferson, this wall that you've uh, established between church and state, that it may be based on your own religious beliefs. No. No. You don't know my religious beliefs. You have no way of knowing that. It's none of your business. <laughs> no, and, and I have no right to to intrude upon your religious sensibilities. You don't, have, you don't have the first clue about my religious views. I'm talking about policy. You know, if, let's take another case. If you put a nativity scene on a courthouse lawn, it may be that every person in that village is a Christian. But you are establishing a state religion when you do so. If there is a single Muslim, a single Jew, a single Lakota Indian, you are imposing on that person on public space using public monies a religion that that person does not inevitably adhere to, and that is a form of tyranny. And so we can be flexible about these things, but once they're challenged, it is our responsibility to back into neutrality, however much it may irk us. That's the code we agreed to when we ratified the Constitution of the United States. Now, we could change that. We could have a new constitutional convention and declare Methodism the state church of the United States. That would be a violation of natural law, but we would have the right to do it. But we didn't. The Constitution is silent on the question of religion. When it comes up in the First Amendment, it creates a wall of separation between church and state. So please don't presume you know my religious sensibilities because you don't. But Mr. Jefferson, were you a Christian? <laughs> this is literally none of your business. I mean, literally. And, and, and in my time, I would have been offended by your question because if I say, let's just say that I said I was a Catholic, then you'll be thinking, well, maybe that's why he holds these opinions about church and state. Maybe that's why he 
bought the Louisiana Territory. You, then you begin to use that as a lens to view action. And so people ask me over and over and over again, Mr. Jefferson, what is your religion? And I steadfastly refused. And finally, a woman pursued it and said, I insist that you declare your religion. And I said, Madam, I'm an apiarian. Like a bee, I flip from one religion to the next and suck out all the honey of each. Maybe we can approach this from a different angle. But you, but you understand the point that if I ask you your religion, you're the president of a college. Your presidential duties have nothing to do with religion. Is that correct? Correct. If I said to you, President Scogan, I insist that you tell me your religion, and you said, I'm a Mormon, or I'm Jewish, I'm Islamic, that would then color your work as an administrator and would allow people to judge you on a basis that's none of their business. If you are a good president, if the classes meet on time, if your professors are people of intelligence and integrity, if you stay within your budget, then you are a good president of this institution. And it doesn't matter whether you are Jew or Gentile. But the minute you declare that, you enable people to show allegiance to your view or to despise it and to make false judgments about your capacities as a citizen and as a professional. Okay, I'm going to get back to your personal views at some point. But I, I just, uh, Mr. Jefferson, today in the world in which we live, there, if one were to be open about their conscience that did not conform to what people expect today, they could never get elected to office. More reason to maintain that privacy. You know, if, if, when I stood for the presidency in 1800, people accused me of being an atheist, as you know. And it was widely brooded about the country that I was an atheist. I, am not, I can tell you this, I'm not an atheist. But if you had said, to me, Mr. Jefferson, if you would just publish a single sentence in the nation's newspaper saying, I, Thomas Jefferson, want to declare that I am not an atheist, and that will make this question go away, I would not have done it. Because it would be an imposition on my privacy and my freedom to grant that to people who have no right to that understanding of my life. If my behavior is good, the religion that is behind it must be a good one. And if my behavior is bad, no matter what religion I adhere to, it must be either the wrong religion or I'm not integrating it into my life. And so behavior is the standard in a republic, not doctrine. Okay. Did Jesus of Nazareth exist? Is he a historical figure? I hope you sense my hesitation here. <laughs> well, no, Mr. Jefferson, if I asked you if Socrates existed... I'm we... going to answer your question. Okay. But I want everyone to understand why I feel so squeamish about this. When I answer these questions, I'm going to begin to divide this republic. And there will people... There will be people here who will never take me as seriously once they know the answer to certain of my questions. And I will be dividing and slicing our republic into factions. And I will gain nothing by doing this. It will not get a letter delivered to your house faster. It will not tax you less or more. It will not defend our coasts and harbors more adequately. It will have nothing to do with my work as the President of the United States. And yet your curiosity is such that you will not let it go. But the minute I open my mouth, I'm going to offend and divide. And I take religion very seriously. You know, people, this is not talking about tax policy or the, the, the flavor of wine that we prize most. We're talking about something deep in the sensibility and the heart of mankind. So having warned you that you are doing an irresponsible thing Ask any question you please. I just did. Do I believe that Jesus was a man? Yes. Yes, we have independent documentation. 
that there was a man um, of Nazareth named Jesus, that he was probably the son of a carpenter, that his life was obscure until he was around 30 years old. Then he practiced a revolutionary ministry, which eventually put him at odds with the Jewish establishment and with the Roman colonial authority, and he was tried and crucified at about the age of 33, and afterwards, based upon his teachings, a, a cult or a sect sprang up. Are you happy? <laughs> well, we're just getting started. What's your opinion, Mr. Jefferson, of the virgin birth of Jesus? I believe that I'm speaking very privately. I, wish, I ask you not to listen. <laughs> because I will offend some. I believe that the virgin birth will come to be classified with other fables and fairy tales of the ancient world. As when we hear of the statue of Minerva weeping blood in the Roman Forum, or of a calf um, speaking in Latin or Greek um, in the Agora of Athens. That these are, you know, I, I believe in natural law. And I would not talk about sexual activity in a public place ever. But as I understand it, you cannot be a virgin and give birth to a child. And so I always gravitate towards law and natural law and physics rather than faith and metaphysics. And so I would say it would be an impossibility for a virgin to be pregnant. What about the issue uh, of the Trinity in, the, uh, in, in many of the Christian churches? Not all of them, but uh, would you ascribe to the Trinity? No. Uh, I don't think a five-year-old can understand the concept of the Trinity. And if a five-year-old can't understand it, then a metaphysician cannot understand it either. Three is one, one is three. Three, as it were, is one. One, rightly understood, is three. This is, in my opinion, literal nonsense. I, the great breakthrough of the Jews was monotheism, as, by the way, with Islam too. Monotheism, a single God. The Romans and the Greeks and, and all uh, ancient cultures had a plethora of gods, a god of the springs, a god of wheat, a god of the sky, a god of the ocean. The Jews and the Mohammedans rightly understood that there can only be one Godhead. Therefore, I'm a Unitarian. And when I was an older man, I said, I hope within 50 years every young American will die a Unitarian. Because I think the Trinity is metaphysical nonsense. I see Jesus as one of the greatest men who ever lived and whose ethics if we would only adhere to it, would bring forth happiness on earth. What are Jesus' ethics? Love God with all your heart. Love thy neighbor as yourself. Forgive your enemies. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In my opinion, that's the sum of human wisdom. If we would all agree to that, we could dispense with the apostles and the Nicene Creed and with the notion of the Trinity and whether Jesus is a man as the Arians believed or a God in some sense embodying a man as others believed. You know, people were burned at the stake over questions of this sort. Burned at the stake. These are concerns not worth a moment's human attention, in my opinion. And so I'm a Unitarian. I believe that I'm not an atheist. I believe that there is a God. In the Declaration of Independence, I called that being the creator, and I believe that if you will go out and look at the planets, or watch the march of the seasons, or watch a bean in a garden press up through the crust of the soil and, 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 and move against gravitation towards the sky, I think you will inevitably realize that there is design, that this is not 
random. This is not a yeasty universe that's just unfolding randomly, that there is design. And where there is design, there is inevitably a designing agent. And so my God, I don't use that term, the creator, in my opinion, is a celestial physicist, a kind of celestial Newton who has spun the planets and created the laws of thermodynamics and the march of the seasons and, and found that it is orderly. And this celestial clockmaker God has created the world and now he stands serenely by, I, I say he only by convention, this being, this entity stands serenely by and admires his handiwork. And he doesn't interfere in your life or in mine and there's no one to pray to. The only prayer would be, I hope gravitation holds up. The only prayer is to admire the handiwork, but not to ask that my wheat come in in abundance or that my child honor her parents. These sorts of prayers are very personal, but they have no listener, in my opinion. Now, Ms. Jefferson, you've been very forthcoming in answering these questions about uh, religion and And it's and a mistake, and because mistake. look at the silence now it's, yeah. of people <laughs> stunned by this. Right. So I want to go back to the question. Are you listening, though? I'm, I'm serious. You have done a dangerous and irresponsible thing. You have, you have taken something that is so... Pr I, could be the, I could be the greatest fool who ever lived on earth with my religious sensibilities. I could be absolutely wrong. The Trinity could be right. Uh, the virgin birth could be right. Jesus maybe walked on water or calmed the storms or raised Lazarus from the dead. I could be 100% wrong about these things, but you have exposed me in something that is not worth a moment's human attention. The question is, was I a good president of the United States? Was the Declaration of Independence a worthy document? Is the University of Virginia an outstanding in intellectual institution? Those are the questions one wants to ask, not... Mr. Jefferson, what is the Holy Spirit? Okay. Um, <laughs> but I want to ask you the question, because then I want to get back to separation of church and state, because I want to ask you this question again that you, you didn't answer before, but you've been very forthcoming now. Would you call yourself a Christian? No. Because, as I understand it, a Christian believes that Christ, that God implanted his essence in a human being. That human being was known as Jesus or the Christ, and that that human being had a ministry and was tortured and killed, and that on the third day, that being, Jesus Christ, rose bodily to heaven. And I don't believe that at all. I believe that Jesus was a great man like Isaac Newton or Socrates, and that his ministry was profound. And I don't, there's no, at no time in my life did I believe that Jesus rose to heaven on the third day. I don't believe that he raised Lazarus. I don't believe that he healed the sick. I don't believe that he walked on water. I don't believe that he turned water into wine or fed the multitude with, with three fishes. I don't mind that you believe those things. As I said in Notes on Virginia, whether you believe in one God or 20 or none at all, neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg, and therefore I don't care. If you pick my pocket, we have a dispute. But if you believe that there are 20 gods, it does me no injury. And so I am not a Christian if by Christian you mean Christ crucified and risen bodily to heaven. Okay, now there are many folks, Mr. Jefferson, that would say that when one uh, ascends to a position as you did, the President of the United States, when one is establishing policy for a country, when one is making decisions that affect the citizens of that nation, that they need to be guided by some sort of internal compass, and that that internal compass is the existence of God, the belief in, in the divinity of Jesus, and that that compass has served us well, and that we are, in fact, a Christian nation, and that the problem with this nation is that we have done exactly what you said, Mr. Jefferson, which is created this wall of separation, and that we've thrown God out, 
and have tried to rule in a secular uh, rule as secular uh, beings as opposed to religious beings. How would you respond to that? Well, that's a serious question. You know, somebody said to me during my lifetime, if you take religion out of the public square, what's the, what's the glue that holds our social fabric together? What's the restraining mechanism if there isn't the idea of judgment in heaven and hell and God sitting and watching human behavior and, and looking into our hearts? If, if, you, if you're purely secular, what restrains humans from mayhem? I think that's a very serious question. There are a couple of answers to it that I have. One is that we are born with a moral sense, just as you're born with a calf muscle or a heart or a lung. Uh, this is, comes from the Scottish Enlightenment. When we're, I said the creator would have been a pitiful bungler had he designed man for social interaction and not given him the tool with which to adjust his social relations. So every, I lived to be 83 years old. Every time in my life that I did something that was wrong, my moral sense told me it was wrong before I did it. Invariably. If you, if, if you see somebody else's telescope sitting in a, in a coffee house and you think, you know, I'd like a telescope, I'll just take that. Your moral sense says no. You're stealing somebody else's property. There is no circumstance, in my view, in which your moral sense doesn't tell you when you're about to do wrong. We learn to veto our moral sense and overwhelm it with self-serving arguments, but it never fails to tell us. Now, there will be a handful of people born without a moral sense, just as there are people born with one arm or a defective leg, but almost everybody has it. And the purpose of public education, and this should matter to you as an educator, the purpose of public education is to strengthen the moral sense. You know, you're born with calf muscles, but that doesn't mean you can run a marathon. You strengthen those muscles by exercise, and education should exercise the moral sense so it becomes an invariable guide to life. And so, number one, I don't think we need Jesus or Mohammed or the Trinity or Moses or any of those things to be human, and to be human is to have a complete moral sense, and if we will follow that, that will almost invariably um, create social harmony and social order. Then you create a system of crime and punishment for those who deliberately overcome their moral sense and damage other people. You, you then try them and sentence them and have restitution. And every society has that, whether they're Islamic or Jewish or Christian or atheist. And so I don't think that there's anything that religion brings to the equation that can't be had in a less oppressive way under natural law. The law of the human heart. I mean, that's why Jesus is so profound. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's natural law. That's the law written on the human heart. Jesus didn't invent that. Jesus discerned it. And so then articulated it in an imperishable way. And so I don't think you need religion. In fact, I think religion gets in the way of the moral sense by confusing you with doctrine and dogma and heresy and apocalyptic notions. Those things I don't think have ever made a single human being better. So what do you think about the clergy that uh, attempts to sell that? I think you're a dangerous man. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand the, the line. There, there are wonderful clergymen. I knew Catholic priests in France, and I've known Unitarian ministers and press. I mean, there are, the clergy is filled with men like other men. Some of them are extraordinary human beings, and some of them are scoundrels. But generally speaking, the clergy is a kind of a lobby that likes to get in bed with government and power to impose upon the simplicity and the goodness of mankind. I said, 
Priests are like cuttlefish. They spread an inky black gloom through the very medium in which they move. If all clerics in the world disappeared tomorrow, the world would be a better place. I'm not asking them to disappear, but generally speaking, I'll take a physicist any day over a cleric. Okay, uh, Mr. Jefferson, I know that there are people out here that you've said a lot of things that people would like to now question you on. Well, great, you do this, and now, <laughs> now you want to unleash the I, wrath of I, mankind. I turn you loose with the masses here. So Robin has a microphone. If anybody has a question for Mr. Jefferson, okay, um, please wait until the microphone gets to you, and then we'll have the questions. I apologize to all of you for the tenor of this conversation. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. This has been very enlightening. As you know, our government today is much bigger than your government was, and it's growing. Many of the new jobs that have been created in the last couple of years have been government jobs, which don't do us much good. Do you think it's necessary for us to have a big government in this day and age to maintain the, uh, the vitality of our nation? I'm very disappointed to see the growth of large government, such government as there is. I would prefer to exist at the township or county level or at the state level, but certainly not in the national sphere. Even as President of the United States, I called the national government the foreign department, and I meant it. That the national government was our foreign body, and the state of Virginia was competent to solve all of its internal concerns. And anytime we look beyond the localist government to something at a greater level of abstraction, we're losing some of our control over our, our own destiny. That's how I saw the world then. How I would see the world in your time, I don't know. But everything I ever wrote was deeply suspicious of the growth of government, particularly national government. Mr. Jefferson, um, I recently read the Jefferson Bible, and I'm really curious of what prompted you to write that uh, particular book, and what was the purpose behind that in your mind? Uh, the, the Jefferson Bible. First of all, I'm not really fond of that phrase because it makes it sound as if I presumed to write or rewrite the Bible, and I didn't. All of my life I was interested in Jesus. As I've said several times, I regard him as one of the greatest men who ever lived. And so it seems to me, and you can disagree with me, but it seems to me that the New Testament leaving the Old Testament out altogether, that the New Testament is an imperfect embodiment of the biography and the sayings of Jesus. We know that some of them were added later, that each of the four evangelists was representing a different doctrinal and a different tradition, that there have been interpolations, uh, some of the texts are corrupt. And so I think any rational being would look on the Bible and say that it's a some, the New Testament and say that it's a somewhat problematical document. And so my goal, this was the quest for the historical Jesus, I wanted to see if I could read the New Testament and to extract a biography of Jesus and his authentic sayings. And so I did this. I was president of the United States and I spent a couple of evenings one during one winter in Washington and I, I bought two identical copies of the New Testament because I was going to use facing pages. And with a razor, I cut out the sayings that I thought were authentic and the biographical details that harmonized in the four Gospels. And then I created a life of Jesus and the sayings of Jesus. And that produced a pamphlet, a kind of a scrapbook of about 42 pages. It contains no apocalyptic matter, no miracles, no mysticism, no healings, no raisings from the dead. It's just the life of Jesus as we understand it and the sayings which are ethical in nature but not metaphysical. I kept that absolutely private. I wouldn't give it to my daughters. People asked me about it. I denied even having played a role in this private meditation. 
John Adams eventually asked me to send him a copy. I did, but I said, you cannot copy it, and you must send it back by return post. Because if it had gotten out, people would have said, oh, well, Jefferson's editing the Word of God, and Jefferson thinks he knows more than the church, and so on. It was a private meditation. It should have ended there, but long after my death, the Congress found it in the Library of Congress, and they published it, I believe, in 1871. And it's been in print ever since, and it's wrongly called the Thomas Jefferson Bible. It's not that at all. I urge each one of you, if you want to take on a very interesting spiritual exercise, to go to the New Testament and to extract the life of Jesus and the sayings which you think are authentic. This has no weight of the presidency or anything else. It's just a, 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 an exercise by a, a scholar of the life and teachings of Jesus. So that's, that's what the Jefferson Bible was. From a historical perspective, uh, most countries slash civilizations last around 200 years. Um, the United States is already pushing that limit. What do you see as the, um, in this country now, as the um, major obstacles in, in this country continuing on? Oh my. Um, again, it's so improper for me to try to talk about your world. Let me tell you how I would see it from my own time and my own place. You're right that most revolutions miscarry and most nations uh, spiral downward the way the Romans did after the time of Julius Caesar. That We have some mechanisms here that might prevent that. When I, and one of them is right here in, in Dakota. When I looked west from the portico at Monticello, I saw 3,000 miles of America. We knew there were Indians, of course, and we respected them, but we essentially saw a blank canvas. No other nation in history has had that advantage of a continent. No tree ever felled, no river ever dammed. I mean, a virgin continent of unbelievable fertility, the Mississippi River Valley, maybe the greatest agricultural river valley on Earth. And so we have natural resources that are the envy of the world even now. And in my time, there were about six million of us, and we were, I think, three quarters of the American people were within 50 miles of the Atlantic Ocean in my time. And so when we looked west, we were just filled with optimism. Secondly, the Constitution. You know, in France, when the French people rose up in revolution in 1789, the only way they could get to a republic was to cut the head off of the king. And in England, in 1641, the British Parliament had to decapitate Charles I to, to make progress. In this, our happy republic, the president retires every fourth year unless we reelect him. And so we have built in protections for ourselves against tyranny. And if the president misbehaves during those four years, we can impeach him. And thanks to Mr. Madison, the House of Representatives is completely renewed every second year and the Senate every sixth year. And you can impeach those individuals too. The Supreme Court, the same. The people can call for a constitutional convention and the Constitution can be amended. So we have all of these revolutionary renewal mechanisms built into our Constitution in a way that was unprecedented in the history of the world when we did these things in 17. 87. I would have gone farther. I wrote a letter to Madison from France in 1787 when the Constitution was being written, and I said, on the principle that the earth belongs to the living and not the dead, we should tear up the Constitution once every generation. You know, we created a Constitution in 1787, then we ratified it, and we lived under it. Well, then what about our children? They did not ratify the Constitution. They did not construct it. It's imposed upon them by the generation that built the Constitution. But that seems like a form of benign tyranny to me. So I said every generation should rewrite the American dream according to its insights and its circumstances, and therefore we should have a mechanism that 
that voids the Constitution once per generation. And I used actuarial and statistical tables to determine that was about 19 years. So every 19 years, we should simply tear up the Constitution and start fresh. And that will keep us young and healthy and, and responsive to the actual world that we live in and not one that the Founding Fathers had instead. So there's a mechanism. I also, this is a North Dakota emphasis, I wanted us to stay close to the farm. You know, if you look at history, a nation of family farmers has never been a corrupt nation. I only wrote one book in my life, Notes on Virginia, but in it I said, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God, if ever he had a chosen people, whose breasts he has made his peculiar deposit for substantial and genuine virtue. If we stay close to the land where, na where nature and natural law prevail, and if we educate our children liberally in public, and if we have a revolutionary renewal mechanism into our basic charters, we probably can extend the life of our republic beyond anything that has ever been seen in the course of human history. But it will take all of that. And what can kill a republic is luxury. The minute stuff matters to you more than liberty, you can say farewell to human liberty. There's one way over there. Um, I'd like you to clarify for me, maybe I misunderstood. You'd said that if you were uh, in a political party now, you'd be a libertarian? Uh, no, I, I didn't say that, although you could infer that. I am, I am a libertarian. That okay. government is best which governs least, and I think that anything that can be done by private individuals or private enterprise or foundation should be done by them, and only those things that must be done by government should be done by government. So that's my, my principle. What I would be in your time, I can't say, because I wasn't the same person in 1805 that I was in 1743, and circumstances create character and personality. And so I've been trying to argue all afternoon that we should never take the Founding Fathers out of their time and place and plop them naively down into a world that they didn't live to see. So but, but my philosophy is a libertarian one. Okay, so you'd said that you were more of a strict con, uh, constitutionalist. Yes. Yet you want to tear up the Constitution every 17 years and rewrite it? 19. <laughs> Do you want me to try to sort that out? Would, would, would you please? Well, uh, okay, let's look at it this way. You don't have to agree with me. Nobody did. You know... I wrote that letter to Madison about tearing up the Constitution every 19 years, and he had a little nervous breakdown over it because he said, you know, we barely got the Constitution we got, Mr. Jefferson. You know, we're not going to go back to the well every generation. But I think, I'm, I think I'm right about this because I believe in consent of the governed. So we created a Constitution, and we ratified it. Every one of the 13 original states ratified in its own way. So we have a social compact. It's not just imposed on the people, it's ratified by ratifying conventions in every state. It became the law of the land. So we are living in the most profound sense with consent of the government. Then we die and our children are alive and they have not had that opportunity. So what I would do is have strict construction of the Constitution during the life of the Constitution, and then when it ceases to work, amend it, and when it ceases to be amendable, to rewrite it, and under any circumstance, to rewrite it every 19 years. Let me give you an example. And I don't want to wade into the policy question on this, but merely to, to talk about it from a, an abstract point of view, the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment was written by Mr. Madison. If you want, I can try to explain what he had in mind. It's the right to keep and bear arms. A high-tech weapon at the time of the drafting of the Second Amendment was a musket that took 40 seconds to reload. That was a high-tech weapon. Surely, the history of weapons technology has to have some weight as you continue to think about the Second Amendment in the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century, the 21st century. There are no absolutes 
that the Founding Fathers created that didn't depend upon circumstance. And so I'm not going to decide. It's not for me to decide. But if you had said to Mr. Madison, the time will come when there will be the, the best weapon in private hands will be able to fire 40 bullets in a minute. I think he would say, we're going to have to fit factor that in as we talk about the Second Amendment. Technologies, circumstance, social conditions, demographics, a whole range of things matter. And so I wrote a letter in 1816 to a man named Samuel Kirchival, and Virginia was considering rewriting its constitution, not the national one, but the commonwealth. And he asked me for my advice. By now, I'm an elderly statesman. And I said this. Some men look on constitutions with a kind of sanctimonious reverence and deem them like the Ark of the Covenant, too sacred to be touched. They ascribe to the men of the preceding age a wisdom more than human and assume what they did to be beyond amendment. I said, I lived in that generation, and it deserves well of its country, but 40 years of experience in government is worth a century of book reading. As our social conditions change, as new discoveries are made, as we know more about the world, our laws and institutions must keep pace with the progress of the human mind. We may as well require a man to wear the coat that fitted him as a child as to require our civilized citizens to live under the regimen of their barbarous ancestors. You see my point, that I want to adhere to the Constitution as ratified for the life of that Constitution, so long as that life is, is limited to a single generation. And then the new generation says, well, what do we want to do about church and state? What do we want to do about the militia? What do we want to do about searches and seizures or the right to self-incrimination? How do we want to organize the Senate? Do we want to filibuster or do we not? How do we want to elect our senators and our representatives? What role do women have in our culture? What role do African Americans? What role do Native Americans? Each generation should make these determinations leaning on the wisdom of the past, but not being slavish to the wisdom of the past, and you will be infinitely better governed, it seems to me. Mr. Jefferson said I was dangerous talking about religion, and he brings up the Second Amendment. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> uh, one more question for Mr. Jefferson. Two more, two. Robin says. Two. We've got two more. Two more questions for Mr. Jefferson, because I know Mr. Jefferson's got a plane to catch. No. <laughs> and, and then I've got a good friend that's going to join us here in just a second. Uh, President Jefferson, I know that, or I believe that you are a deist who believes that the Creator does not intervene in your life. I'm curious, though, um, in times of adversity or difficulty, if you ever pray for help or support or are tempted to do so. That's an excellent question. And again, it's a very private one, and I would not answer it in my lifetime. I think everyone prays in, in crisis. I, but when I prayed, I didn't think that anyone was listening. When my daughter died, I had six children. Four of them died before their seventh birthday. Two of my daughters lived to be adults. Martha, who survived me, my beloved child, and Maria, my second child, died in 1804 while I was serving my first term as president. She died on April 17, 1804. That was the greatest blow of my life. I had lost everything that mattered to me. My wife died when she was 33. My closest friend died. Dabney Carr when he was 34. My mother died when I was writing the Declaration of Independence. My father when I was 14. Four of my six children. And loss and grief were central to my life. And I, I suppose you could say that I'm a kind of grieving optimist. And when my daughter died, I was home at Monticello at the time, and she was too. And uh, my family said that I was then seen holding a Bible and weeping and paging through it, I think everyone in these moments wants to get out from under his own self-isolation and to look to the great texts, the great wisdom, and, and hope for consolation of some sort. 
but I didn't pray in the sense that I think you may intend. I, I never prayed thinking that God would answer a prayer. I think when you pray, if you're a secularist as I am, an deist, you pray to somehow have the wisdom to understand things that are mysterious to you. And that, I don't think that there is a, a being who can answer that prayer. I think that you are really asking questions that are unanswerable questions, but the articulation of them is somehow soothing to the human spirit. Mr. Jefferson, today we have organizations uh, like ones that I will refer to, uh, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, which apparently ascribes to your wall of separation between church and state and engages in contests all over the country to prevent communities from putting uh, monuments of the Ten Commandments before courthouses and things like that. And there are those in our nation who, uh, who blame that fight or those efforts as part of the reason for a certain moral decay that they see. How do you respond to that? I suppose you could look at it scientifically and ask yourself if this is true. Maybe it is true. Maybe we would be, maybe a, a, a nation with a more overt public religious life would be a better nation. I don't, it doesn't ring true to me. It, it's a, it, it violates my own philosophy of the thing. It violates my understanding of the moral sense and it violates it, almost everything that I believed in a, in a lifetime of reading when I was a young man, I read 15 hours a day in seven languages. I'm, I'm certainly one of the readingest presidents, maybe the readingest president. I had the best library in America. I consulted it incessantly. I cannot live without books. I see the world through books. And everything I believe and have studied in other nations and nations where there's a state religion and so on tells me that, that our wall of separation is the right one and that there are restraining mechanisms that don't require a formal religion. But I could be completely wrong, and I think that only time can tell. The ACLU didn't exist in my time, but I think from what I know of it, and leaving out the parts that seem so persnickety that they annoy, but if you look at just the basis of what the ACLU stands for, that... It, it, it squares exactly with my own opinion, which is that we can be flexible until somebody challenges it, and when somebody challenges it, you have to step back and say, well, what is the, what is the basic principle of American life? And it turns out the basic principle of American life is for a wall of separation. And if you take that phrase out, the same principle continues, that, that in our culture, the state is officially neutral. And so if somebody, if, if maybe there has been a, a uh, crash at the courthouse square f for the whole history of a community and no one's ever said a word and everyone accepts it and, and even cherishes it. But if someone comes and says, I object to that because it violates the First Amendment, then I think that it's the responsibility of the state to swallow hard and agree to that because that creates the foundation of an establishment. It means that the Jewish person, who's also going to that courthouse, has now been told that the state privileges a Christian establishment and therefore is not privileging a Jewish establishment or an Islamic establishment or a Lakota establishment. And so even if there is virtual unanimity in the community, it still violates this principle. And so I think this ACLU is right even when they offend. And if we can't accept that, then we should change the basic charters of this country. But we shouldn't grumble about a, a social compact that we have agreed to, because we emphatically did. And you know, when, when the Constitution was finished and, pe and the Founding Fathers were filing out of the hall in Philadelphia, someone said to Hamilton, no friend of mine, said, why did you leave God out of the Constitution? And he, he was much more cynical than I was, but he said, we never thought of it. You know? <laughs> We're trying to tell you how you elect a senator here. 
know, we're trying to tell you how you coin money. It, this is a secular document. Go worship any god you choose. But this is a secular social compact. And so if you want to have a crash in your house, fine. If you want to have a crash in your chapel, in your backyard, private property, in your wherever you want to do this except the public square where there's public money. On the public square where there's public money, on this campus, for example, or on the courthouse lawn, to do that would be an establishment. And, and just let me reverse the lens. If, if for some reason the mayor of Bismarck wanted to put up an Islamic um, tableau on the courthouse lawn, people would say, how dare you? How dare you? use state money to impose on us a viewpoint that's not ours. Well, the same happens the other way around because you cannot, looking around this room, you don't know if there's a Jew here. You don't know if there is a Muslim here. You don't know if there is a Jehovah's Witness here. You don't know if there is a deist here. You can't know that. And so the state has to bend over backwards to be neutral, even if the overwhelming demographics are of a certain religious sensibility. And... When we adhere to that, we are a successful nation, and when we violate that, we almost invariably, in my lifetime, put ourselves into difficulties. President Skogan, I'm over this direction now. Here oh, we are. I'm sorry. We have an individual who has been waiting very patiently to address Mr. T Jefferson. Thank you. If you would, one more question, Citizen Jefferson. Uh, as father of the Declaration of Independence, you do refer to nature's God, and perhaps you choose not to imbibe or answer upon this question, but you made reference to nature's God being able to make a bean sprout come through the crust, the dry crust of the earth, against the force of gravity and in that is illustrated the power of the creator. If nature's God can make a bean sprout do this, what causes you, if I may ask, to refuse to believe that the creator can cause a virgin to become with child? Look at the time. Uh, that, uh, now, we're at, now we're at the parable of the mustard seed, aren't we? Um, I can't rule out what you're saying. It would be against um, the history of you know, 10 billion or more people who've all been born the usual way. Um, it would seem to me very odd that the creator would do this. You know, he didn't make that. I, here's where I disagree with you. He didn't, he didn't look at that bean and say, erupt. He planted the germs in beans to do that. In other words, he's not willing it. He created the system under which these things occur. And nature works invariably according to these natural laws. And whenever there's a freak of nature, which this would definitely be, uh, it's usually seen as an exception to the rule, but it violates the principles of physics. I'm a, I'm a materialist. I, you know, if you want to understand me, and, and I don't see any reason why, I don't, I don't regard myself as important in that way, but you could read the correspondence between me and John Adams. You know, we were good friends until the French Revolution, and then we began to diverge, and eventually I displaced him as president, and he took it personally, and he left Washington without waiting to see me inaugurated in his place, the greatest snub in the history of presidential transitions. He went back to Quincy, Massachusetts, and I never saw him again. I didn't see him from February, from March 2nd, 1801, until we died on the same day, on the 4th of July, 1826, and so I never saw him again. But in 1812, we began to correspond. And we corresponded about a whole range of subjects. And in one of these letters, I said, I'm a materialist. I believe, and I know that many of you will now disagree with this, 
but I believe the soul is corpuscular. That there's no independent status of the soul. When the body dies, the soul dies with it. And so anything that I'm, I like physics, but I don't like metaphysics. And I don't believe that there's anything beyond the capacity of physics to describe it. I believe the neurology of the brain will be described. I believe the soul will be understood as a corpuscular or as a material thing. I don't think that there's anything that ultimately will be seen as mystery and that the, the ingenuity of mankind will penetrate all the secrets of the universe and that there will be no room left for faith. I believe that very strongly, but I don't believe it as a faith. I believe it as a scientist. I could be completely wrong. That's why I say that the evidence, if the evidence is there, um, the evidence will prove itself. But if you look at ancient history, there are many, many, many instances of virgin birth, only one of which the world has chosen to believe. Okay. On that note, Mr. Jefferson, um, what I would like to do is we're going to do a transformation. The first thing is I would like all of you to thank Mr. Jefferson for being here today. And now please welcome Clay Jenkinson to our stage. Well, first of all, I want to kill Larry. Um, I mean, you see, I mean, I've, I've, I've been trying for the last while here to be so careful, you know, that Jefferson is a very unusual human being. He's our strangest of all the founding fathers. He's a deist, he's a Unitarian, he's not a Christian. He's intensely private. He's this radical revolutionary who wants to tear up the Constitution. And so I'm doing my best to stay rigidly in character. And he never in the course of his lifetime would have answered the kind of nitwit questions you've been putting to me. <laughs> and we had this conversation. I told you he wouldn't answer them. And then you asked anyway. But, you, but I hope you appreciate this, that his character, that this is, think of the, think of the, the humility of that and not you compare him, and I mean no disrespect, to Bill Clinton or to Barack Obama or to George W. or Herbert Walker Bush, these people who are perfectly happy to tell you everything. And Jefferson's view is, wait a minute, you know, I'm not important. My views don't matter. These, let's talk about policy. I think that's so remarkable that Jefferson was private about these questions. And, you know, he was, he's not an atheist. He's a deist. There's not a lot of difference between the two, but he's, he's definitely not an atheist. But if he, here's, what's, here's something that we need to think about as people. If you had, go back to the election of 2012, if Mitt Romney or Barack Obama had said that they had serious doubts about the divinity of Jesus, that'd be it. So how did that happen? That in Jefferson's time you could be a deist and be the president of the United States and tell the truth, and in our time, you either have to pretend to be a Christian or be one in a nation whose constitution says there will be no religious tests. Our constitution, not the Bill of Rights, but the constitution says there will be no religious tests in the United States. In other words, your civic opportunities are not dependent upon your religious views. And yet, we continue to ask candidates for this, and they continue to tell us. And in doing so, we damage the republic, in my view. Uh, the election of 1800, though, Jefferson was vilified in some quarters because of his religious beliefs as well. It wasn't that people were just ignoring that. He won nevertheless. But why don't you talk about what happened to him during the election? Well, and I, and I said in character, and I meant it, that you know the, the jury may still be out about these questions, but Jefferson believed that that we can be a great nation without having a state religion. Many people disagreed with him. Almost most people, I would say, disagreed with him at that time. And, you know, what I always say when we talk about this is that we, our Constitution was written at the high watermark of the European Enlightenment, which was a secularist movement. If, if we had been, if our Constitution had been written 
30 years sooner or even 20 years later, it would be a very different constitution. We, we came in as a secular nation because we came in at that moment when Freemasonry and deism and Unitarianism and rationality were, were, were in the ascendant. And the Second Great Awakening happened shortly thereafter, and we've, we've become a much more religious country now than we were then. And so these are, these are contingent, historically contingent things. But when Jefferson was standing for the presidency, he was widely accused of being an atheist, and he wouldn't respond because I think of his integrity. But it's literally the case that in Delaware, preachers told elderly women to bury their Bibles in their gardens because when Jefferson was elected, he was going to confiscate all copies of the Bible. And he was called a filthy atheist and a vile atheist and a f infidel and you name it. And this was held against him and it, it hurt him politically. But he wouldn't respond because he didn't regard it as anyone's business. And he didn't make, you know, he didn't pretend to be anything that he wasn't. It was an amazingly courageous thing, I think. But this... The issue of his so-called atheism dogged him throughout his political life. And ever since then, people have attempted to prove that he was a Christian. But he wasn't. He's not an atheist, but he's not a Christian. And this book sort of came slightly out of this book, Larry. David Barton has a book called The Jefferson Lies, which came out of last summer, I think, and he tries to prove that Jefferson is a Christian. But you can only prove that Jefferson is a Christian by ignoring the evidence because, I mean, in my view of choose any founding father and you're on better ground if that's what you want to prove. But even George Washington, who was a much more typical American than Jefferson, in his extensive correspondence, which runs to tens of volumes, George Washington only refers to Jesus on five occasions in his life. He, too, was a deist. Franklin was a deist. Madison was a deist. Even John Adams was a deist at the end of his life. This was a very deistic age and a Unitarian age, and one reason why Jefferson is regarded as sort of the father of the Unitarian Church in America is because he was the first great American Unitarian, not a Trinitarian. And so... I, my only view is we need to accept Jefferson as Jefferson. And if I were David Barton, I would choose any founding father other than Jefferson if I were trying to prove that they were Christians, and many of them were. But his point is that if he could take Jefferson and prove that he was a Christian, then in fact we're a Christian nation. Well, that's but, the other question. You know, are we a Christian nation? And I go back to what I said in character. We are, if you look at the 335 million Americans, we're overwhelmingly Christian. Catholics, Methodists, Lutherans, etc. There are, I think, five million Jews in America, and I think there are four million Muslims in America, and there are L Lakota Indians and F Flathead Indians, and there are Hindus and Baha'i, and I mean, we have a almost unbelievable range of religious sensibilities in the United States. But there are now as many Jews in America as there were Americans in the age of Jefferson. And so demographically, we've always been a Christian nation, but officially, we have never been a Christian nation. And in fact, in 1797, the United States entered into a, a treaty with Tripoli, one of the Islamic states of North Africa. And in the preamble of that treaty, we explicitly said we are not a Christian nation, we are a secular nation, and that's why you can treat us differently from the Christian nations that you've been raiding uh, in the Mediterranean Ocean. Now, part of that was diplomatic, but, but, but we just have to accept as a historical fact that the United States officially has never been a Christian nation. That doesn't mean we're not overwhelmingly Christian as a people, but people who try to say, well, the Founding Fathers wanted us to be X are almost always wrong when they say they intended a Christian nation because then you have to say, well, go to the Charter the Constitution, and show me, show me in the Constitution where the Founding Fathers intended us to be a Christian nation. And nobody can do this because it's not there. And I've debated these folks, and they'll say, well, it was so universally understood that they didn't need to articulate it. Well, that's kind of crazy notion. I mean, they articulated 
how many votes it takes to impeach a president. You know, they put in what they wanted. And so we don't have to agree with them, and we might want to change it, but we do have to be historically respectful of the tradition out of which we've come. So do, do we have, do you think, Clay, now, uh, a religious test? I mean, you, you already said if Obama or, or Mitt Romney had said that they don't believe in the divinity of Christ, that they could not get elected, and I think we all kind of agree with that. I think if you stood up and said that you did not believe in the divinity of Jesus, it would be really difficult to get a nomination and win an election. Do you guys agree with that? Okay. So does that mean that we have a religious test De for facto. president? I mean, there's, this could get complicated, and I'm just sensing people want to burst out of here in spite of the beauty of this day. But uh, we have a constitution with a capital C, and then we have a constitution with a small c. For example, filibustering is not in the capital C constitution, but it's a very important part of Senate procedure. We have lots of things that constitute the way we do business that are not in the Constitution. Judicial review is not in the Constitution, yet it's one of the central doctrines of American public life. So you have your large C Constitution, and that's what everyone always says, well, the Founding Fathers this and the Founding Fathers that. And then you have this small C Constitution, which is more like the British Constitution, judicial decisions, traditions, rituals, styles, and so on. And they all are part of the way we constitute ourselves. So today... We do not have a religious test, but we have a de facto religious test. But look at what's happened. We're going to have this giant symposium on John F. Kennedy next November in this very room on the 5th through the 7th, and I hope you'll all come. You, if you're old enough, you remember that his Catholicism was a serious problem, and he gave the famous speech in West Virginia to say, hey, you know, I turn not to the Pope, but to the Constitution of the United States. John Kennedy is elected in 1960 as the first Catholic president, and he breaks a barrier. Mitt Romney was very nearly elected president a few months ago, and his LDS affiliations were not a significant issue. Even 15 or 20 years ago, that would have been a much more serious issue than it is. I think that there is a, there's a widening tolerance in American life about religious views that are not standard ones are not within the heart of the Protestant of the Catholic tradition. And I think that will continue to extend itself. But I still think that one of the pieties, that one of the charades that some politicians go through is pretending they're devout Christians when we don't know what they are, but they, this is the kind of political theater that they go through because it's, it's a smart thing to do because the country is overwhelmingly Christian, and so it pays off politically, but I think it's a mistake. I think Jefferson was right to say, let's talk policy. Do you think that sort of attitude in our country now has really blurred or torn down that wall between church and state that Jefferson talked about? No, I think that the, the wall, boy, this is tough ground, you know. Let me give you an example. Uh, my daughter is now going to college in the East, but she was in a school in Kansas, a red, red, red part of Kansas, and before football games, they prayed. So the coach would call together everybody and say, we're now going to pray, and they would pray to the, to a, a, a kind of an ecumenical Protestant God. And my former wife is an ACLU uh, advocate, and so she would go up to, and a lawyer, and she would go up to the school and say, you know, the Supreme Court decided in such and such a year, and then again in this year, and here are all the documents, and that's actually illegal. And they would say, well, we've always done it. And she'd say, yeah, but it's illegal. And there were Jehovah's Witnesses in that school that couldn't do it, and others, and so then they said to her, how about this? We'll continue to pray, but your child can go stand in the corner while we pray. Think of that. That's what Jefferson's talking about. The presumption that because most of us are Lutherans or most of us are Catholics, that that's what the community intends. And the Constitution says, no, we've got to protect 
the Jehovah's Witness child, the Islamic child, the Lakota child, the atheist child, the agnostic child. We can't impose one standard on the community because we can't presume what people are thinking. This happens over and over and over again. And when I see these cases, you, know, you see the nuisance case where somebody from Oakland files against In God We Trust and it goes back and forth forever and so on. There's a lot of that that rubs all of us the wrong way. You know, people, professional complainers who want to get involved in every little thing. At the same time, according to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and all the accumulated court decisions, the ACLU is almost invariably right about this when they raise these questions. It's almost invariably a de facto establishment that they are questioning. And it bugs us because it bugs us, but it doesn't mean that they're not right. And enlightenment is the capacity to see that things are right even when they piss us off. We're almost out of time, and I'm just wondering if anybody would like to ask Clay Jenkinson a question as opposed to Mr. Jefferson. I've never squirmed so much in two hours in my life, Larry. I, I resent you. Um. I spent a lot of time reading Jefferson. I've read his letters. I've read books about his letters. I know you're not exactly accurate. That doesn't bother me. But what does is why should we take Jefferson's opinion on the separation of church and state when it was not even in his time the majority opinion? Well, there are two things to say to that. And I said one in character. You don't need to. I mean, Jefferson, I said I'm sheepish about the wall of separation. Jefferson never intended that letter to become as important as it's become. It just did. I mean, he had that peculiar felicity for expression, and the courts have seized upon that. But the answer to your question is that the Constitution backs up Jefferson. You know, if the Constitution had intended us to be a Christian nation, it would have said so. If the Constitution had intended there to be a state church, it would have declared that. The Constitution is neutral and secular and silent on those questions which tells you what you need to know. Jefferson may be a rather extremist, rationalist advocate of that point of view, but nobody can argue that the Constitution intended what it didn't say. The, 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 the right, that's, that's what I just said. We pick that out of a letter. What it does Right. If you go back and read all the documents, and the people in the consensus of the time, yes, they wanted, they wanted freedom of religion. They did not want the government to pass any legislation governing their religion, including inhibiting their own speech. They didn't mean inhibiting it on government property. There is no clause in there that says you have the freedom of religion, religion except in a schoolhouse. Where does it say that in the Constitution? Look, I'm not going to get into this fight with you. Obviously, you know what you know, and you believe what you believe, and you're pretty sure of yourself. That's fine. And you may be right, and I could be completely wrong. I think you're wrong. I think you're demonstrably wrong. But we can agree to disagree as rational friends, as Jefferson would say. But just because you hold these opinions doesn't make them right, and just because I hold mine doesn't make me right. One has to examine the documents. But the point, as I understand it, was that in your house you can pray 100% of the time. In school, if you want to pray while everyone else is studying geography, you go ahead and pray. In your chapel, you can worship any god you please. You know, Our government does not restrain people's religious activities whatsoever. You can pray right now. You could be praying while I'm blabbing on here. What government has said, and courts have to interpret these things because they were not explicit about this, but what government has said in our time is that public spaces with public monies have to be protected against religious establishments because of this doctrine in the First Amendment as paraphrased by Thomas Jefferson. In other words, they're not coming out of Jefferson to the Constitution. They're coming out of the Constitution to Jefferson's phraseology. You may be right. I may be wrong. We, we can't settle that question because we don't, the Constitution doesn't say 
There'll be no prayer in schools. There'll be no baccalaureate. There'll be no crash on a courthouse lawn. There'll be no Ten Commandments on a courthouse wall. The Constitution doesn't say that. The courts have to interpret what's in the Constitution to apply it to real world cases, and this is the tendency of the courts of the 20th century. I think they're right, you think they're wrong, but we're inevitably bound up in letting the courts decide because that's how our culture has agreed to settle disputes about ambiguous clauses in the Constitution. Okay, I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, we are going to, on March 24th, we're going to do uh, another conversation here. It won't be with Thomas Jefferson. Uh, it'll be Clay and, and the Clay and Larry show here. And uh, we're going to have, we're going to talk about the North Dakota legislature and, and historical retrospective. And of course, we've got a session going on right now, and it'll be kind of fun to sit around and talk about the legislature and the history behind it. And uh, I certainly want to thank all of you for coming, and I particularly want to thank uh, Mr. Jefferson for being here today, and uh, my good friend Clay Jenkinson, and, uh, and we really appreciate that you uh, came in character. When we started this whole conversation, Clay said, I won't do it in character, but this one just had to have him in character, and thank you for doing that, Clay. Thank you.